opportunity that's been offered to us. And there's uh, public comment, any public comment? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. We did not receive public comment, but for the benefit of all attendees virtually today, I will briefly explain how to participate in public comment at board meetings. To protect the safety of meeting attendees, this meeting is being conducted through electronic communication means pursuant to and in compliance with the City of Richmond Ordinance Number 2020-093, adopted April 9, 2020. Video and audio of board meetings are streamed live online and recorded for later viewing at GRTC's YouTube channel. Board meeting notices, agendas, and packets are available at GRTC's website, ridegrtc.com. Citizens are welcome to provide their comments in writing in advance to carry.rosepace at ridegrtc.com. The person responsible for receiving comments in writing is Carrie Rose Pace, Director of Communication. All written comments received via email prior to 5 p.m. on the day preceding a meeting will be provided to all members of the board the night before the meeting and will be included in the minutes of the meeting. During the public comments portion of the agenda, Carrie Rose Pace will read all comments received by the submission deadline following the two minute speaking time limit normally observed in board meetings. This meeting, I received no submitted comments in writing to be read, and this concludes the announcement. All right, thank you very much for that. I think um, the agenda today is uh, is in the hands of um, Adrian and Scudder. We're really grateful for your being here. I'll, I'll just note that um, Danny Smith and uh, Eldridge Coles and Gary Armstrong, Ian Milliken and I are here representing the board that George Braxton was unable to be here. All right, uh, if you all would go, Adrian, I think you've got this, right? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, Scudder is going to kind of be the main lead on it, but uh, I'll just go over kind of what we were planning on approaching. We'll go over the two concepts um, in various quadrants, showing the comparison of the two. And we'll also go over kind of um, the logic that we went through with the jurisdictions and kind of the same effort. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off to Scudder. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so let me share screen here. That working, everyone can see my PowerPoint. Yes. And y'all can hear me? Yeah, <laughs> okay. to both. <laughs> Good. All right. Just want to make sure. Um, so yeah, just we want to update you all on the conversations we had <laughs> with TPO Working Group, uh, remind you all about the differences in the concepts, and uh, update you about those conversations with the Working Group with jurisdiction staff that we had following the board meeting last week, and then um, hopefully get your consideration of a, resol a policy resolution to provide the guidance that we think will help solidify the policy direction. So just a reminder of the concepts that we drew and what, um, what they looked like and the differences, the ridership concept, 100% of regional resources going to high ridership service, 0% uh, going to covered service. However, there are many things in the ridership concept that are coverage oriented, but would be locally funded only. The coverage network is approximately 70% regional resources going to high ridership things, meaning where things are dense, walkable, linear, proximate in general, and 30% going to coverage oriented service places that are not as dense, not as walkable, not as linear, but there is some compelling need um, or other uh, sense of equity need to go to those places. Um, so just a reminder of walking through these differences between the two concepts and how they spend the regional resources across the, the service area. <clears throat> In the Northern and Eastern parts of the city and Henrico County, the ridership concept spends by going to 30 minute service on Brook Road from the current end of Route 1 up to Parham and Brook. The extension of Route 3 up Meadow Bridge and Azalea to Chamberlain Wilmer every 30 minutes with a small extension of 15 minute service to Laburnum. 
And then every 15 minute service, which is an improvement, uh, doubling of frequency today on Route 7 from downtown to Laburnum and Nine Mile, uh, the Wal just a little bit beyond that really to the Walmart shopping center. The coverage concept spends resources differently by focusing more on lower frequency going farther. So the Brook Road service and the coverage concept is hourly going all the way to Virginia Center Commons. There is a, another branch of Route 1 going out Azalea and Meadow Bridge to Hanover County, and the hospital, uh, Memorial Regional Hospital. The Route 3 extension every 30 minutes on Azalea and Meadow Bridge is the same every 30 minutes in this concept. And in this concept, there is no frequency improvement on Route 7 on Nine Mile. Instead, Route 14 uh, would be extended to take over for Route 4B along Williamsburg to Henrico Arms and then extended further every 30 minutes to White Oak and all the way to the airport um, with every 30 minute service. So those are the differences between the two concepts in this part of the region. Um, this part of the region, obviously mostly the city and Henrico, um, the coverage concept did extend service just slightly over the line into Hanover. The working through the trade-offs of different you know, priorities here between these, uh, these differences um, and we're talking with jurisdiction and staff in the TPO working group last week. Um, everyone felt that yes, the three that we drew in both concepts that extend service up Meadowbridge and Azalea is very valuable. They felt that the 30 minute service to Brook and Parham was the most useful thing to do um, with the funding. Um, the, and then in thinking about the uh, frequency on Nine Mile Road going to every 15 minutes versus the extension out Williamsburg Road, um, most everyone agreed that the Nine Mile frequency improvement was the most useful thing to do uh, in large part because this hits so many more people um, who are in poverty or minority residents and drastically increases their, their access because of that doubling of, of service. It also hits the community hospital there uh, and takes all of these folks to a significant shopping destination in the suburbs, but also connects them with significantly more frequency in downtown to all of the other places they can connect to across the region. So Scudder, let me ask you about that. Uh, when, yep. you, when you decide, for example, to recommend on the seven that it moved from a, from a 30, 30 minute frequency to a 15 minute frequency, are you basing that partly on the volume of use that's already present? A little bit on the volume of use that's uh, present, but mo more directly on the, the obvious um, density of people and jobs and poverty in this corridor. They're very high uh, along this corridor and that increase in frequency would therefore reach um, a, a, a great many people, a great many people in poverty and a great many people in general. Also would serve the hospital um, and connect all of those people to major shopping destinations and to all of the other access they can reach by making connections downtown. Um, the, frequency, the frequency of service is obviously a huge factor when you think about those connections as well, because when we're talking about connections and transfers, Increases in frequency make an enormous difference in people's ability to get lots of places. Well, I mean, I know the route well, and it's uh, it's Church Hill, but the um, and and the Eastern Henrico. But the question is why one moves it from thirty to fifteen, and um, that's I'm just trying to understand. That's all. So um, I have a couple of other other tools that we can go to other than just this presentation at times, and so I can compare for you. Um, so this is this is the. Um, this is the tool that we actually use when we're when we're in conversation with staff and talking about possible trade-offs. And so um, this is you know a hand-drawn sketch of the ridership concept map showing that frequency on on Nine Mile Road as compared to the coverage network concept where you see the extension now at Williamsburg. And in this map, we will often go back and forth and compare the effect of things like what is the residential density along different parts of these corridors? What is the, what is the poverty density? How much poverty density is there in these, corridor, in these corridors? 
um, and uh, race and ethnicity, looking at you know how much uh, how many people of different races and ethnicities uh, and minorities uh, minority residents uh, are along these these corridors, and the the seven corridor hits pretty high marks on all of those factors relative to the extension of service out here um, where we don't see particularly high levels um, along that corridor compared to the potential increase in frequency on the Route 7. Great, thank you. Eldridge, did you have something? Yeah, uh, I want to know this, this is just weekday. What about weekends? So the increase in frequency on Route 7 uh, would be six days a week. So it would be Monday through Saturday. So it would align with the high frequency service on the existing network that you see. Um, if I go back to our presentation really momentarily here. Um, so all of the red lines that you see um, the, on Chamberlain, on um, North Avenue, on 4th and so on, those run 15 every 15 minutes from roughly 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. on weekdays and Saturdays. And so this increase in frequency on the seven would be designed to be the same pattern of frequency. So every 15 minutes from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. And then 30 minute frequency when all of those other routes are running a 30 minute service, which is usually until roughly midnight and um, in the evenings on those days and then Sundays all day. Uh, roughly, you know, 6 a.m. to 11 a.m., depending on the exact route. And the other question was, uh, Ben and I, we talked about uh, going to JSARGE and Reynolds. Uh, mm -hmm. How would that operate? Would that operate from Burke Road out to uh, the Burnham, to JSARGE and Reynolds? Or, or so, would it go to also to uh, Virginia Center Commons? So the, the, in working with the TPO working group, they, um, Henrico and, and Richmond staff in particular who are the primary partners in discussing this part of the region. Um, their preference was every 30 minutes up Brook Road through Villa Park Drive to the Walmart Shopping Center. Um, we have been looking at different options for whether you could get to the J. Sargent Reynolds campus on Parham. Um, we, it appears there may be enough time to be able to do that. And what I mean by there's enough time it takes roughly two buses to run this every 30 minute service and there's enough spare time and extra layover potentially at the end of this route to get to JSARGE. Exactly how we would design that, we'd need to go back and talk to Henrico mm -hmm. about how um, that would actually get designed. Okay. But there are there some was, there should be, there was uh, at one time service up Brook Road to, uh, like I said, to the Walmart and then over to uh, JSARGE and Reynolds. And it also went to uh, Virginia Center Commons, so that there should be some information that uh, available on that route. Well, Villa Park Drive is a is a, a 1.2 mile um, vacant road, um, and uh, it's only eight tenths of a mile to um, Reynolds from the corner of uh, of Parham and Brook. So, I think that's really worth considering, and I hope you'll do so. Um, because we have we have been looking at that for about ten years. So the so thinking just to think through kind of some of the trade offs of that possibility, and I'll I can again flip back to this this um, drawing that we uh, that we tend to go through. Um, it's from Villa Park Drive, I believe. It is about uh, six tenths. Well, round trip though it's. You always got to think about the bus having to go in through and back out and it's mm -hmm. about a mile and a half when you start in you know dealing with the how you actually circulate through the campus and get back um, and the different options here of what you could do are um, um, lost my mouse um, you could come up through Villa Park Drive go to the campus and back over to the Walmart that's a bit circuitous and out of the way for people who just want to get to the shopping center, which is probably going to be a sizable number of, of riders because we know these kinds of shopping centers with Walmarts and all the destinations that you have there are, are big ridership generators. 
most of the time. So that is, that's one path. It's a pretty circuitous path for a lot of, for taking a lot of people through a long deviation. There's another option of coming straight up Book Road, skipping Villa Park Drive, um, navigating through the shopping center in some capacity, we hope, um, and then going over to an ending at the, um, the community college, which is the red dot on this map, by the way. Um, that's more direct. That means people who are just going to the shopping center don't really don't go out, way out of their way, which is generally better. Um, the main concern about the two main concerns about that are um, Henrico has expressed a strong interest in trying to serve Villa Park Drive. Obviously, it's not the best territory right now, given there's no sidewalks and it's relatively low density, but they've expressed a strong interest in serving that. Um, and then secondly, the, the, uh, the, the secondary consideration where we need to talk with Jay Sarge is um, the access to restrooms, because you really need access to restrooms at the end of the line for this service. Um, Thank you, Scudder. Um, yeah. One other quick question here. The, am I to understand that the Chamberlain bus doesn't currently go all the way up to Azalea? The Chamberlain bus today does go all the way up to Azalea. It, it goes up Chamberlain and then it does a loop, Azalea, Brook, what's the back road? Wilmer, and then lays over and then south on Chamberlain to come back. When we say that, that is the current. So the 3 would be, but one of the things you said is that the 3A gets extended to Azalea and Chamberlain. Am I, oh, that's the 3, I see. The 3, yeah. So the 3 currently, this is the existing map, and let me just turn a few things off so it's a little easier to see. This is the existing 3, which ends in a loop in Highland Park. Okay, thank and you. And we would be extending that north along Meadow Bridge to Azalea to that shopping center in that loop at Chamberlain okay. and Wilmer. Thank you. Any further questions? Please Real go quick, ahead. Scudder, just so I can understand, um, probably just more in general about when we look at routes and we try to figure out which ones we should increase frequency on. Um, touching on the number seven, do we look at like the current ridership and mm -hmm. we, we know that that's getting ready to be maxed out and that's why that's a, a good route to increase the frequency. Um, and then also, I guess, with the, uh, the population density that you mentioned there earlier, do we get a, a good feeling for on similar routes or historically, if we increase frequency from 30 minutes to 15 minutes, how much additional ridership that should pick up? Um, to answer your last question first, we can, you can look at past trends, but um, ultimately predicting ridership is almost always a, a, a fool's errand. It's, it's, it, there's so many other factors that ultimately affect the actual ridership you get out of any given route or any given system a lot of them completely outside your control, like gas prices. Um, the reason the, the number seven stands out as a particularly, a, a route that has a particularly high likelihood of being successful as you increase frequency is like uh, Chamberlain, like North Avenue, um, like Sims Avenue or Hall Street, it is a very linear and direct radial path into and out of the city that's, a, that's lined with a lot of relative density and a lot of mixed uses uh, along the way. And those kinds of corridors are almost always writers, strong ridership generators as you increase frequency. Gotcha, and do we know how the, the current route is doing? Is it pretty, pretty yeah. solid? Um, just a moment here. Um, I've got a couple of different tools open, but I don't have the, um, the other tool I could use, which is our current ridership um, patterns and information. So let me pull that up momentarily. You're getting, y'all are getting a deep look behind the curtain and all the different tools we use as we're drawing all this stuff. So <laughs> to flip around between them. Um, so this is an interactive uh, mapping tool that we use that shows the, um, the ridership patterns and the activity. And we see along, um, along the corridor, this is, um, it's a little hard to track because there's actually two separate routes in this data, but you see, you know, regular ridership numbers in the dozens and tens up and down this corridor on any in on either or of these routes. So you're, you know, seeing uh, daily daily uh, boardings in the order of 10 to 20 at least or more along most of these stops on the corridor. Um, and the weekday productivity numbers for this route are in the 19 to 20 range, which is quite high for, you know, for, for, 
for routes that are 30 minutes, 60 minutes type, uh, type level. So they perform pretty high on productivity terms even today, suggesting that higher frequency would be, a pay, would be paid off. And I'll add to that. We did have some trips that were hitting capacity issues with standing room only, especially um, with commuters. They would use that to get to like VCU, um, to get downtown for service. Not all trips, but the quite a few in the morning and in the evening. So this was already kind of on the prioritized list in the near future for Henrico to eventually kind of enhance service. So Henrico and Richmond are both both behind this change, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And this kind of, I remember the Route 8 that we put in with the network redesign, this kind of brings that back alive, goes back to the Walmart shopping center, which is just really a great resource for people in the city to go right across the county line to go to a grocery store too. Mm -hmm. Is there any ridership data on where people board, originally board and the like, whether they board in the city or board in the county or light in the county? Or in the city or what? So we have, this is detailed information about um, how many people are boarding at each stop. So you, you can, we can click on any given stop here and see how many people are boarding at any given stop um, along the route. Um, we, this does not track a full trip. So we can't tell you if someone is getting on here at 25th and S for example, where they're getting off we do know how many people are getting off. We just don't know which stop they happen to get onto. We can't tie that together. Um, I, I was just I was we just did do a, in, me. We did do an origin and destination survey uh -huh. um, 20, end of 2019 and we, we did all of the routes. So we do have where they got on, what jurisdiction they got on and where they got off. So we can provide right. that to you, but you see a lot of crossover. And of course, the general pattern quite often is um, many people making round trips. So if you see a lot of boardings at a particular location, you have a pretty good sense that those folks are probably at some point in the day also getting off at that stop <laughs> when they're coming back or vice versa. They're getting yeah, off. I, I wasn't concerned about just stop to stop. I was yeah. just wondering about uh, the locality, whether they boarded in the city and how many uh, got off in the county and vice versa. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of it's a lot on both city and county side here. You see you see a large number of boarding dots um, at the shopping centers in the county out uh -huh. here. Um, that Walmart shopping center um, being a big driver of ridership out here. Thirty six a day on the seven B, for example, um, at that shopping center, um, which is a pretty good number on weekdays. All right, let me go back here. So, um, so this was the, this was the um, kind of consensus among that TPO working group for this part of the region. Um, the other note about this area, and this affects both the east and the west sides that we'll, we'll come back to the west side in a minute, but the Route 5, um, which is from Carytown through VCU downtown into Whitcomb and Mosby, um, the working group, particularly the city of Richmond, did feel like that turning that up to every 10 minutes was a very worthwhile thing to do um, with the understanding that that means Route 39 would go away as part of that uh, turning up the frequency on Route 5. So that's another piece of this East End. Now that would need to be justified by ridership um, being dense at this point in time, I would think. And it's pretty dense. That's a very high productivity route. Um, so we can come back here to this and look at. And one you're going to add as well to that, um, the uh, 30 minute service to University of Richmond? Yes, so that, that would be, the 30 minute service to the University of Richmond would be an extension of this Route 5. Yes, mm -hmm. so we can look at that actually um, in <clears throat> this map um, where we show the Route 5 going to Carytown and then that's every 10 minutes to Carry Town. And so you can think about that as every third bus continues onward out Carry Street to Malvern to Grove and then onward to the University of Richmond. So and and that replaces the um, the current 77. That replaces the current 77. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyone from U of R or along the stretch of Grove still has 30 minute service. It is just now 30 minute service that goes um, all the way to downtown, which today it ends at VCU. Um, and goes via Cary Street, Main Street. 
um, into and out of downtown. And VCU will be very happy with the, with the increased um, frequency of the five. I suspect they will. Yeah, right. um, yeah. And this does mean, of course, that the 77 on Grove in May in the museum district and the fan would go away. So there would no longer be service on that that section of would be much weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so that's the TPO working group consensus for the eastern part, including Route Five. Um, going to the western, we've talked about Route Five, the differences there where where people fell on that. Um, thinking the ridership concept included turning up the frequency of Route 19 to every 20 minutes, included turning up the frequency of the outer Patterson three chopped route and extending it into a West End loop to be combined with the 18 so that now Staples Mill, Parham, Mayland, Pemberton, all of that would be hooked together into one large 30 minute looping route coming in and out of Little Lawn. Um, You're and, combining two routes there, um, Scotty? Yeah, and in fact, we probably should talk a little more long term about what what you call that route number. On all of these maps, we've called it the 18 slash 79, um, but it really is kind of a different route from anything you've got today. It's it is a it is a the southern part of it is the 79 basically. This uh, eastern part of it is the 18, and then we've hooked it all together into one long route. Um, the advantage the advantage there being that. Um, once you've drawn a 30 minute route out this far from either direction, either of these quarters, they basically end up coming together anyway. So if we make it all one continuous route, you have lots and lots of uh, trip connections on one, uh, on one route. Uh, the coverage concept kept 30 minute service on uh, broad, but extended it in just barely into Goochland to Wilkes Ridge Parkway. Um, and it took that 1879 pattern on Staples Mill, Mayland, Parham, and um, Three Chopped and Patterson and turned it into an hourly route and extended it all the way to Innsbruck. The discussion with the TPO working group, which again, for this part of the region was mostly talking about what Richmond and Henry Niker really preferred to do, um, really landed basically on what the, um, what the ridership concept drew. So 20 minute service on broad, um, ending today at that Bonsworth Parkway loop there is very strong interest from, from Henrico County in going ahead and extending the Wilkes Ridge Parkway, which may be possible if we can um, find just an extra minute or two in the schedule of that route to extend it out there, even at every 20 minutes. Um, which is where Shelter and Arms is at the moment. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and this and it puts us in Goochland, if you go there, by the way. It puts you in Goochland, yeah. it does. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be you know, another jurisdiction included in the region. Um, although as I would be remiss to say as a transit planner, uh, if I didn't point out this kind of continuous sprawl always causes you challenges because if, you know, when you have a route that's designed to have a certain frequency and a certain schedule and to you know, maximize its efficiency so you don't have a lot of excess layover, if you wanna extend it five more minutes down the road, it costs you an extra bus sometimes. So, yeah. If you keep stretching that development further and further out, it's gonna make it harder and harder for yourself. Um, so so this, the TPO consensus here was basically the ridership concept. With one slight adjustment, we did come back and decide that um, this route 18 slash 79 should go out Cuyacus and all the way to Gaskins so that we get close to this shopping center at Gaskins and, um, and Cuyacus and, and go up Gaskins and then back on three chop to Pemberton to Mayland. So that was one slight difference from what we drew originally. Um, any question about the, the TPO working group consensus here? I'm looking at that um, 29 Express and wondering what that is and what that's about. You're right, I should have, I should have clarified that. Yeah, in both concepts, we, looked, we explored the possibility of providing a, re basically creating a reverse commute option. Um, you know, the 19 and the BRT on Broad Street are extremely useful, they're frequent, but they do, it, it's a really long ride to get all the way out to the far west end. Um, it takes a long time because local service obviously is stopping fairly regularly. So 
the 29X is already coming out here at peak times all the way to this park and ride and for a very small additional number of, of revenue hours, um, we can effectively extend it. And it's a little easier to see if I go to my Photoshop map, so I'll go there. If we create a reverse pattern that extends the route to Innsbruck so that the way this would function is in the morning, if you were in downtown Richmond and you wanted to get out here to Innsbruck or you know somewhere further out west even on Broad Street, you could pick up the 29X, ride all the way out here and the, and the 29X would ride out 64 and it would, sorry, I'm using my cursor. It would come out 64 all the way to 295 and then get off at Knuckles Road and go through Innsbruck on, on Knuckles and Cox before going to the park and ride. And so if you wanted to get to these shopping centers, if you worked out here, you could ride that bus all the way out there and have a much, much faster trip. Um, and even transfer the 19 if you want to go somewhere further west. And then once it gets to the park and ride, it would do its normal morning AM peak commute for the kind of office worker going downtown type trip. Um, it basically adds 10 minutes to the, to the round trip scheduling time, um, which means it doesn't add up to a really big additional cost here, but it does provide a pretty useful reverse commute option at peak times for people. It'll be interesting to watch yeah. uh, to see if that's what that does. You know, functionally speaking, again, it doesn't it doesn't cost much, but it turns what is currently just a you know park and ride office commute oriented route into something that is a bit more useful in both directions. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so then going to the southern part of the region, the ridership concept. Before you move on, Scott, I just want to add in the enhancement about the weekend service for the 18 and 79. That's kind of. Good point. You can take that away if you want. Oh, um, today they only have service Monday through Friday on the 18 and 79. The 79, of course, has been a um, request um, from many riders to have service on the weekends. And this does provide it for both of those routes. So the big value there, of course, is weekend service uh, every 30 minutes to St. Mary's, um, to Henrico Doctors Hospital on, um, on Forest, to the, to the Regency area where there's a whole lot of shopping, um, and a fair number of apartments here along Cuyahocasan um, that you don't have today. Um, and likewise to Parham Doctors Hospital on this part of the loop. So that all would be, we think, pretty valuable. Is that our only service to uh, St. Mary's? <clears throat> so the 76 would still exist. Um, and if you're coming out from, you know, if you live along Patterson or Kensington in the museum district or the West End, for example, that would be probably your fastest way, but the frequency is pretty low. Um, so I would imagine most people going to or from the hospital would choose this 1879 route. It would get and, you to BRT. And does it match their um, their working shifts? Working. So this the what we've assumed in this is a route that runs like most of the other thirty minute routes in the primary network today. So roughly six a.m., maybe a little bit earlier, perhaps as early as five a.m. until midnight, okay. um, seven okay. days a week, roughly. Yeah. Thank you. The big value, of course, being there's weekend service because so many workers who need to go to the hospital need to be, be able to go on weekends and weekdays. Yes, so. excellent. Um, so yeah, so in the southern part of the service area, the ridership concept had 30 minute service on the 1A extended out Midlothian to Chesterfield Town Center. It included a revision of Route 2B and 1C so that the 2B went from, um, it's instead of serving Midlothian, because we now have the 1A on Midlothian, it would go via Warwick to Southside Plaza, and the 1C would now be every 30 minutes to Chippenham uh, Mall and uh, Hall Street, which is an improvement on that section of Hall Street from Warwick to Chippenham Mall. And the 111 would basically be subsumed into the 3B. 
so that you would no longer be forced to transfer at the food line. If you were trying to go north from Chesterfield, you can just ride through. It would also mean adding Sunday service to that section um, of US High Route 1, Richmond Highway in Chesterfield. And there was some question of another mile extension on that, correct? There is, um, I don't know, Adrian, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, we're exploring that or planning that to happen um, in the June booking. It's not currently incorporated in, I don't think in the figures that you have that are, that kind of came around after we kicked off the plan. Um, but the plan is to move forward with that for June. We're working on fitting it in the schedule with no increase in operators. Um, as well as no additional vehicles. We're assuming we have enough time in the current schedule. To move it a mile further down mm -hmm. Route 1. Yeah, to Greenlee. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's not shown on this map, and that is something we're still making sure is still going to work with this merging it into 3B. So mm -hmm. we're just trying to verify that. Um, the other aspect of the ridership concept that I, that I didn't mention before, but want to make sure I mention is that the, it did assume 10 minute service on Chamberlain and Hall in the city from Chamberlain and Wilmer on the north side through downtown to almost to Southside Plaza here on Hall Street. Um, so that was a significant improvement in investment and service that would, uh, would help if you did it to Swansboro, Blackwell neighborhoods in the city, for example, anyone coming to or from Southside Plaza along that corridor. And of course, to the entire Chamberlain corridor from downtown to uh, Azalea basically would, would, would see significant benefit from that increase in frequency. The coverage concept would not have that frequency on Hull and Chamberlain. Um, it would still have the Chesterfield Town Center service every 30 minutes. It would have hourly service down Hull Street all the way to Commonwealth Center. Um, <clears throat> it would have hourly service in three new routes going out uh, through South Richmond into Chesterfield, the 84 to Wilkinson Terrace, the 85 to Chesterfield Government Center and onward to John Tyler Community College on Route 1. And then this 86 route, which is an extension of the current uh, city 86 route that would go out Hopkins, Ironbridge, uh, excuse me, Hopkins uh, Road, not Ironbridge, to uh, Meadowdale and turning over to the food line on Route 1. Uh, would also include that making Route 111 part of the 3B. What is the route to uh, Chesterfield Government Center? Is that down Ironbridge? That's down Ironbridge, Route yeah. 10. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Route 85 on this map. Yeah. Um, so in talking with the TPO working group and particularly the city in Chesterfield who have uh, who are the primary jurisdictions here, um, everyone agreed that 30 minute service to Midlothian uh, <coughs> Center was a very high priority. Um, that uh, the 30 minute service on Hull to Chippenham Mall was also uh, very important to, the, to everyone and made sense. The other priorities, everyone that after a long discussion, they felt they wanted to invest in uh, was the 60 minute service to Wilkinson Terrace, the 60 minute service to Chesterfield Government Center and 60 minute service to Meadowdale Boulevard um, and, and making sure that the 3B was, was uh, extended to include Route 111. Um, so this is a, effectively more of the coverage oriented design for this part of the city and this part of the region. So no 10 minute service on Hall and Chamberlain and instead um, more hourly service out to these three areas of the city and the county, the Wilkinson Terrace area on this Route 84, the um, Ironbridge Road, Route 10, down to the government center, and just as far as the government center, because that's all we can afford in the balance of, of everything else. And then the extended Route 86 to Meadowdale Boulevard. Um, and just to give you all a sense of the reasoning behind things, I'll go back to this, this uh, this hand sketch map um, and look at that part of the region. Um, so this is the coverage concept for this region. So you see the, actually, this is the consensus of the group, the design, the 84, the 85, and the 86 routes. Um, no service extension on Hall Street beyond Chippenham Mall in that consensus that we worked through. Let me just turn a few things off. But a couple of highlights of why go to these particular areas. 
I'll point to are number one, the poverty density, the 84 and 86 extensions um, really hit some key pockets of, of relatively high poverty density in Chesterfield County, in particular on Belmont and Walmsley in the county and along Meadowdale Boulevard in the county. But also along the way, this 84 and 85 structure as drawn could potentially allow 30 minute frequency on Broad Rock uh, Boulevard in the city from Walmsley to Southside Plaza, which would provide improved frequency to areas of relatively high poverty density in the city on the south side. So do these, um... I mean, I'm happy to see service in Chesterfield. Um, um, you know, I think prayers get answered after, you know, a while, and this is kind of <laughs> neat to see. Um, the uh, We don't, however, want people to complain about buses that don't have a whole lot of people in them going mm -hmm. by. Mm -hmm. um, the um, Are these are these routes connectable into the city itself? So if somebody wants, uh, wants to go to work somewhere else, they can actually get on it and end up, um, you know, going through the city to Henrico or into the city. So these these three routes, like a lot of stuff on the south side, end at Southside Plaza. And you know, some some reasoning for that is um, there are not obvious candidates to latch these on to other existing routes that would not create challenges of routes that are so long that your operators would get, you know, get that because you, you get to at a point where routes get so long that number one, reliability is a big problem. You know, if you, if you have a two hour or three hour, if you have a three hour or more round trip ride on a route, um, that means that there's so many more opportunities for, for reliability to be a problem on that, on that route. But secondly, of course, the longer the route generally the harder it is on operators. So when you get to a three hour round trip, that gets to be particularly hard on operators. Um, this, what we do want, want to encourage you and uh, the city, and we've discussed this through this process uh, multiple times with the city, is the need to have a facility at Southside Plaza. Yes, oh yes. Because sure. this would mean more, more routes that terminate at Southside Plaza and you need space for that to, to happen. So drivers have a reasonable lo location to layover. But more importantly, by having a good transfer center in the vicinity of Southside Plaza, you can time connections for these routes so that even though someone has to transfer, if they're say coming from um, Wilkinson Terrace to Southside Plaza and say they wanna go to Chippenham Hospital, what you can do is with some of these routes, you can time these hourly connections in the schedule so that the 84 arrives at that transfer center at the same time the 2B is there and there's a five minute wait and then you're on your way. And with hourly routes, that, that, time, that kind of time connection is really, really important because if you don't have a time connection, then you have a really long wait on average. So that's the kind of thing that you, that you as you know, a GRTC would, would, we would strongly encourage trying to design is that as a pulse or timed connection at that point for these hourly routes. So this, this proposal has um, these three new green routes, hourly routes here. Uh, one goes to the, to the um, government center as well. Mm -hmm. So folks can get to social services and so mm -hmm. on. Um, and it has a 30 minute route out Midlothian to um, Chesterfield Town Center, where it goes down through it a bit, apparently, uh, in yeah. order to meet some of that stuff that's at that end of it. Yeah, you know, the Midlothian- So there are four, basically four routes uh, kind of extending out into Chesterfield, plus the 111 consolidated into the 3B. Yeah, there's, so there's effectively five routes going yeah. out of Chesterfield with this, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that is a significant extension. And yeah, the details of exactly where this route will turn around at, Ch at Chesterfield Towns are, are stu still to be determined. What, I've, what we've drawn here is the longest the route might be. So we've done that to ensure that there's enough time in the schedule if it has to be that long. Um, but just a, the Midlothian corridor obviously has a lot of challenges with walkability and your ability to cross the corridor. And as you get out here, to Chesterfield Town Center, 
more of the major destinations are on the north side. So we've tried to draw a route that goes by the hospital very directly, you know, almost by the front door of the hospital, and then back around into the shopping center and gets very close to a lot of that retail. So. Um, where does the uh, the current express that comes from Bonaire, where does, does that stop at, um, is that at Huguenot Road or does that come up toward the uh, Chippenham? It's a little hard to see goes? here. I'll zoom in. This, I can turn on the existing map in this. Because we do serve Chesterfield with that as well, um, although the city pays for it. We, yeah, we, we, we you all, hug the city county line right here on Huguenot with the with the one-way loop on the 64. Mm -hmm. okay. It comes out forest and then does a, a one-way loop on Huguenot um, and then back into the neighborhood okay. uh, before going back into the city. So yeah, you, you just yeah. touch the county there. So Ian, Gary, Danny, do you all have any comments on this? This is pretty significant stuff. Well, one question I have is for the 1A extension, uh, of course, going out in Midlothian, there will be bus stops along the way and I know that initially when we first tried you know, bringing buses out in Chesterfield, especially down Midlothian, the traffic, it just was in the morning and evening, it was just made it very difficult for the bus to stop and that people being, you know, slowed down, getting to work and things like that. I mean, it's just not conducive to no way to get off, I guess you might say, mm -hmm. uh, without impairing traffic flow. Yeah, the, these kinds of, of fairly wide and fast arterial suburban corridors do present a challenge with um, the amount of traffic at peak times and the sense from drivers of kind of the bus being in the way at times. Um, the, it's a bit hard to really get around that problem because um, you, today with Route 2B, you try to avoid that to some degree by turning off quite often um into parking lots of businesses or shopping centers the the problem that would create for you long term is it would take a lot of time to do that and get all the way out to chesterfield town center it would and if you wanted to do that it would end up costing you an extra bus or two because of all the time it would take yeah. for the buses to do that i mean i i think it's it's I think it's a good move it's just that i know what happened the very first time we brought uh buses out to chesterfield going down the middle of corridor mm -hmm. That was one of the uh, unpleasant things for the for the uh, commuters, you might say. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it makes perfect sense because it gives people an opportunity to come into the county because that is a busy corridor. There are opportunities for employment there, and and just a variety of things that make it appealing. But uh, sometimes our residents aren't quite as uh, willing to agree with that <laughs> when they're going to and from. Uh, because it's really not a, an opportunity to, you're not really touching very many communities. So you really, it's almost a, it, it's just difficult. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. You have a, you have a challenge say, of, oh, sorry, Adrian. I would say a comparable conversation is uh, when we put bus stops out in shore pump area, very similar. We actually went and like bus stop by bus stop with them, whether we should pull into a turn lane or should we stay on the street? Um, you'll see a mix in there. We had the conversation of it. If we pull out, sometimes we can't get back in. So we worked quite um, in a detailed way with our traffic engineering department. Um, some stops got removed because we didn't want to stop traffic flow for certain areas. Right. Um, so I would assume a very similar conversation. Yeah, you don't want to get in the way of intersections that are, are, are pretty main corridors as well. Yeah, one of the, so a couple of the, a couple of the uh, approaches that, that everyone will probably want to think carefully about for this for this corridor and this is definitely probably this corridor and the broad street corridor in the west end of, of henrico are probably two of the biggest challenges in this respect um, number one the the relatively limited places you can cross the street mean where you where you do have crosswalks or you do have opportunities to cross the street and you're going to want to put a stop there because that's where you can really provide actual service in both directions without endangering people's lives um, and then secondly thinking about how you can design those stops and potentially improved infrastructure so that you can provide the stop while minimizing all those other impacts. So you might want to, you know, work with VDOT and, and the county on putting stops um, either in turn lanes, if that's possible, or far side of the intersection in some kind of a pull-off. Because if you're on the far side of the intersection in a pull-off, 
you have more of an opportunity to be able to pull out of the stop. The problem with a pull off bus stop near side of an intersection is the bus stop pulls off, the bus pulls off into the, into the, to the stop, picks up, drops off people. And then now there's a line of traffic next to the bus. They can't get out. No one will let them get out because they don't want to wait for the bus and, and you create a lot of delay. So there's a whole lot of trade-offs there, but I certainly encourage everyone to think carefully about. The other thing is if you get off on the, you know, one side of Midlothian and you got to go to the other side, crossing Midlothian during busy times is very difficult. In fact, I've seen it, uh, it's, it's scary to me to see some people trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It, safe, safe crossing locations on Midlothian is probably going to be one of the biggest challenges for, for this, um, for this route. I think you'll also see some people ride around. We saw that in Short Pump where they didn't want to cross the street. So they'll actually ride to the end of the route and ride it back and then they'll get off so they don't have to unsafely cross the street. So you might see some of that. <clears throat> well, it's got to happen. I mean, we've got to learn and uh, get I agree. pedestrians. I mean, so, I'm not yeah. opposed to it. I'm just thinking yeah. some of the things that initially came up. Scudder, what did you just uh, do to the map when you put these? Uh, yeah, colors? so this, this different color scheme, this is the job density. So this is, you know, to help everyone see um, that when we're talking about people riding to get to jobs, the Midlothian corridor is the most significant corridor in Chesterfield for that, that potential. So you will likely see on that corridor many people riding out in the morning to jobs, um, to retail centers, to, uh, to, the, to the hospital and whatnot along the corridor. That's, that is a lot of what the market of this corridor is about. Gary, Ian, which? No, so I guess the uh, same question though with the, the green routes, does the 1A connect back into the city or does it um, also just stop at, at uh, Southside Plaza? The 1A continues onward. So the 1A and the 1C drawn on here go through. So they go, they merge together at Southside Plaza to become the every 15 minute uh, trunk route on Hall and Chamberlain that then goes all the way to the north side. So if you got on the 1A here at Chesterfield Town Center in this design, you could ride all the way through downtown up to Chamberlain and Wilmer and connect to anything in between. Um, Interesting, okay. And if you got on the 1C here at Chippenham Mall in this design, you can ride all the way through downtown and up all the way to Perriman Brook. So this, this Perriman Brook extension would be part of the 1C. Hey, Scott, this is Gary. Um, you know, I, I, I probably haven't asked this question in a few years, and I certainly haven't asked it since Julie's been here, but is there a way to, to do hybrid routes that would be, um, I'll call them coverage and ridership hybrid, but some way that you adjust frequency based on time of day or, or you know, for, you know more, more appropriately around rush hour versus middle of the day? Is that possible? You can, however, you don't usually end up saving much money, particularly if you talk about a midday versus peak differential. Um, if you're, if you're, for example, if you're putting out, you know, every 15 minute service at peak times and every 30 minute service in the middle of the day, the, the way driver shifts get split up for just a couple hours in the morning, just a couple hours in the afternoon to provide that extra frequency um, doesn't usually end up saving you a whole lot once you account for the extra deadhead time of going back and forth and the split the the, the split shift effects on your overall um, ability to um, design your operator your operators schedules so you can fluctuate um, some agencies do much more fluctuation between peak and midday but um, in our experience, having a more consistent across the across most of the day from you know morning until you know, at least the the early evening is generally a pattern that's going to get you higher ridership across the the whole um the whole day week and year oh I, we used to do that at, we used to do that at grtc where we had a lot higher at peak and we actually found that a lot of our midday ridership was pretty consistent with the peaks. I guess work schedules just, just changed over time. Shift workers, it's just very different. So it actually, uh, the midday, yeah, it was like miss, miss riders at that point. Yeah. Hey, Julie, have you done this in your past at your other locations? 
Yes. Uh, we there have there's always that discussion about the trade off and Scudder really did nail it on the head that um, when you start looking at the operations for our operators doing the peak hours and the, the PM rush hour and the, the AM rush hour and really trying to put more service during those times and then reduce it midday, you end up with a lot of those operators having a split shift or staying um, having layovers at side at, at the, the um, at our our maintenance area. And so you don't get a lot of the efficiencies that you would think that you would by doing that. Um, keeping them on the road also allows for uh, some of the midday uses that when you don't have the, the midday frequency there, uh, sometimes you miss some riders who might have the seniors and the students and the midday workers using it to go to lunch, using it to get it back, uh, that when the service depresses during the midday, people are less likely to take the bus to the peaks because they can't use it for the middle day to go to lunch or do a an off time need, if the service is still there throughout the entire day, they're more likely to use it for those other needs as well. And so you get a more continuous uniform use. Okay. Scudder, is that pretty much consistent with what you've seen as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we had the conversation in Nashville as well about some of the midday frequencies and people who refuse to use transit or not refuse, but maybe were hesitant to use it because they get to and from work, but then they felt stranded midday. Okay. This is Danny. The, you know, the destination, say, for instance, for Chesterfield Town Center, uh, I could envision, you know, individuals using that as a park and ride, you might say. Is it parking? You know, at Chesterfield, Center, Chesterfield Town Center is quite different now than what it was 10, 20 years ago, but... Uh, do they do the destination points have the ability to do a park and ride? Basic, in essence, a park and ride. We wouldn't necessarily call it that per se, but just be utilized in that capacity. I don't know what the capacity is out there. Um, this Route One A is designed. I would be surprised if it would draw a large number of people using it in a park and ride capacity. Someone who already owns a car is, is much more likely to use it to go where they want to go unless they're going somewhere where the, where the charge for parking their vehicle is going to be very high, which in general in, in Richmond is just downtown. Um, and the travel time, because this is a local route, the travel time from um, Chesterfield Town Center to downtown is relatively long. Um, compared to the drive time. So it is, you know, That's someone true. who already has a car is probably going to gonna be willing to pay the cost to park. That's a good now. point. It's not a f very few stops along the way. It's more or less an express and right. kind of like what we have on Hull Street now. Mm -hmm. um, um, was there, there any? Sorry, go ahead, Ben. Sorry. Was there any consideration given to running the Midlothian um, bus straight into Hull Street rather than taking it through South South Plaza? Um, no, we didn't look at that in detail then primarily because if we don't, then we lose that 15 minute frequency on this section of Hull Street between Midlothian and Belt Boulevard. And also you lose all of these potential connections for folks coming from these 84, 85, 86 routes or the 88 route to connect to the Chesterfield Town Center service. So Southside Plaza, is in, that whole vicinity is, is really critical for this ability to transfer from most anywhere in Southside and the county to anywhere else along these routes. Yeah. If I may, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, this mm -hmm. map is really, I have to say, this one and then the, um, the one that shows the, the low income is what really convinced me that the 100% ridership model, we need to be adjusted for this area. When you look at where all the green is and the connectivity of the low income, and then you look at the this, the job and the connections now that people have to get from some of the low income communities to key job access. Um, and that being some of the, the core ridership that we have now, knowing that's our core market, um, really convinced me that these connections are going to be critical for our some of our disenfranchised communities. Good. Yeah. Yeah. You think about you think about this map of poverty density, 
and obviously many people in poverty work service jobs, work retail jobs. Um, and a lot of those jobs are, you know, in this corridor. <laughs> so that connectivity of this corridor to Southside Plaza to connect to all of these other routes is really critical for those folks, for many of these folks to be able to access those jobs in a reasonable amount of time. Well, it would be wonderful to see um, Julie and, and uh, fellow board members and staff, if we could really move forward on the uh, on some form of transfer center and and at least it doesn't have to be elaborate, but some place where these buses can connect there at Southside Plaza. Right now, they're all over the street, and um, if we're going to do it, um, I think um, it would be a good thing to do. What else you got, guys? This is great. Um, yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head, Ben. I think that the next discussion after we figure this out is, is the transfer plazas. We're going to have a regional network. We need to be able to, you know, transfer people to the right buses, you know, safely and quickly and, and everything else. So I think um, this just sets us up for, for figuring out, uh, figuring out that. But no, I, I like what I've seen today. And I, and adding to the transfer discussion, I would just note that obviously the downtown transfer facility is a critical part of the discussion. The other critical part of the discussion I would point to is a reasonable transfer facility in the, in the area of Willow Lawn. Right. Um, the, right now you're, you're, you're spending a lot of time looping all the way around Staples Mill um, and Monument and Willow Lawn um, in order to, to avoid impacts to some of the surrounding properties from, from circulating buses. <clears throat> and um, having, a, having a proper transfer point there um, would allow you to organize things a bit more so that you might be able to have timed connections between say Route 76, some of these hourly services like Route 76 and 91, um, for example, so that it, you have a bit more access for some of the routes. So that's another. And if I might, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, that really the way uh, some of Adrian's focus next year is going to definitely be on that. We have the study right now for that area that Sarah mentioned. We also have the partnership we have with the city of Richmond looking at downtown right now for a transfer center. And we have some discussions with the city as well about um, the south side and whether or not there's a potential we could use our own property here as a home base for that kind of connection. Yeah, there's been, um, I know there's, I mean, there's all that space at Southside Plaza, but um, not real clear plans for what it's all going to be. And uh, we do have property two blocks away. So mm -hmm. it's uh, interesting. All right. How's, is that it for the presentation? Do we have more here? That's it for the presentation. We, um, I have other slides I can go to that mm -hmm. answer some of your questions if there are any further questions. But the, you know, the primary, um, uh, idea hopefully was to get you all to agree to a policy resolution that you know defines this this effective consensus that we have it seems from the jurisdictions and the TPO working group um, we've we've done the math and the estimate is that you know within a five percent margin of error because all of these ridership coverage calculations are roughly you know plus or minus a little bit but about 85 percent of the uh, the regional funding in this consensus recommendation from the TPO working group is going towards ridership goals and about 15% of regional um, funding is going towards coverage goals. So um, the, I believe we have a draft policy resolution that was sent along for your consideration that would, um, I believe has a blank space in the amount that could go towards coverage goals. And so if you all agree with this TPO working group recommendation, that blank spot would be 15% based on this. Um, does 15 give you enough uh, leeway or do you need it to be like 20? Um, not to exceed not to exceed 20 or something like that. I mean, I just don't want you to get caught up in some kind of weird thing where you're, you're at 16 and, uh, and can't, can't afford it. Um, that's obviously, you all can provide additional flexibility there. I think as a policy re recommend, as a policy resolution defining the, the the general policy guidance, this is not something that we have to say. It's not like service guidelines where we're going to calculate every year and make sure every every revenue hour is uh, perfectly aligned. Um, it's it's a general guidance about where to go. 
So um, I think 15% is probably enough is, is enough wiggle room here for you know what we have drawn with the with the uh, jurisdictions. And all I'm worried about is a is a uh, legality thing that uh, would snarl this up. Um, Since this is not um, this is not an ordinance, this is not I don't I don't know Julie, you know how things may be defined for your policies, but this is a this is a policy resolution. It is um, I guess this is not a directive. It's it's non-binding in that case, but what it could do there's there's two ways to look at this. Uh, the language specifically that we're talking about it says. There's a whole lot of language in the very last paragraph is that GRTC transit system may prioritize up to, but not more than blank percent of the CBTA uh, Central Virginia Transportation Fund revenues towards coverage. So if we ever got to a point where we felt like we needed to exceed that, then the board could reconsider it. Um, you could also suggest that the language instead of saying it may prioritize up to, but no more than, you could change the language to be DRTC may prioritize um, in the range of 15% to give you a little bit of wiggle room around that. So it kind of gives us a target or that DRTC may target approximately 15%. It's the very last one. Thank you, Scudder. Um, so we can, we can change that to, to give more flexibility or you can just have it be prioritized up to that 15% to reflect what we have here. And then if there's a desire of the region to do more than that, it would give us a reason to revisit this resolution and to consider what's being asked um, at that time. And I can see there's value to both of those. I tend to lean towards this with an up to 15%. And if we need to go over it to come back and revisit it, but both have value. Um, that feels fine to me, up to 15%. How do the rest of you feel? Well, Ben, down in uh, in Chesterfield in our discussion last week, uh, running through everything, I mean, they they basically went to the 20, 2080. So um, I'm just laying that out there that from their standpoint, and probably a little bit more as you think broadly outside of Richmond and, and the major routes in Henrico, you know, that would probably be a, the feeling is a little more on the coverage side, but, you know, I think the study has told us, I, I believe that Julie's right, that we need to be very focused on ridership. I'm just kind of letting you know that Chesterfield felt like 20% was the reasonable number. We kind of started at 30%, they kind of got to 20%. Julie and staff, you guys had more conversation. You may have some more input on that as well. Yeah, if I can add to that, I Sutter and Adrian, you can add to it. But Originally, when you were talking uh, with staff, it was 2080, but I think that the numbers you have now are still reflecting what Chesterfield want, but yours, where you were looking before that kind of a feel, this is more mm -hmm. precise. Right. And I would say the Chesterfield area is still 80-20. It's the, when you look at it as a whole, it's more 85-15. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it, is that the, the, yeah. the, the the balance in resources in the in the southern part of the region and in, in you know South Richmond and in, and in um, in Chesterfield reflects more like a 70 30 to 80 20 split in resources but when you combine it with the region as a whole particularly the the northern part of the north of the river the city and um Casey and Lico, it ends up about 80 hey can I call you back in about 10 minutes okay. Rob you're you're on you're on something here whoops Yep. <laughs> All right, some more comments from board members. So, um, yeah. I just want to be, be sensitive to what Gary just said, Mr. Armitage just said that, because when we were there, they were very adamant that um, what they had talked with about and what you just showed, Scudder and Adrian, with the, the three extensions and 30 minute service, that, that reflected in 80 20. But what I think that what you're saying on this meeting is that while y'all talked about that as 80-20, as you're looking at the actual numbers, this is what they agreed to and what they're calling 80-20, but what you're calling now 15-85. Right. In the, in the conversations we had with staff last week, we were talking about this as you know, probably landing around 80-20 um, when we sat down to really finalize the math over the weekend as we're moving very quickly on this process. Um, we estimate the, that it lands at 85-15. Um, so Gary, I just wanted to, uh, sorry, I just wanted to clarify that, that that's when they were talking 8020, they were talking about this map. 
which is now kind of with refinement closer to an 8515, but it gives them everything they were asking for through those conversations. The resolution alludes to 7030, so we need, would we need to change that resolution? Our resolution uh, says, um, well, are you looking at the same resolution I'm looking at? It's got a blank. The one that came with uh, the announcement of the meeting. Well, um, I don't know, but here's the one we're looking at right now. So I'll check it out. This is the one we're looking at. It's got a bunch of whereases, which yeah. you know talk about um, you know God, mother, and country, and then we've got um, <laughs> <laughs> then we've got these two resolves down at the bottom, which I think are the things. Um, up before us. So the only thing that concerns me a little bit about the wording is that it sets the ceiling without setting a floor. Um, if we do an approximate and we've got the, the target, um, the current wording, you could revert back to a 2% or a 3% um, you know, coverage model. And if, if we're aiming for this 15%, I'd, I'd rather have wording saying that we're aiming towards a 15%, not just being up to 15, if that makes sense. Well, here's what concerns me about it, Ian, and I, I see what you're saying. I mean, what we don't know yet, I mean, I think long term, my, my assumption is that CVTA funds will be prioritized toward major trunk routes that serve the entire region, and that local funds from the different jurisdictions will be prioritized toward the, the most um, coverage-oriented non-trunk non routes. And that those two priorities will have to meet. Um, that hadn't happened yet. So we're in the middle of this strange period where we're just for the first time um, actually paying for some coverage routes in Chesterfield that if they were in the city of Richmond, the city of Richmond might be paying for, or if they were in Henrico, the county of Henrico might be paying for, in order to get the system up and running and let the let the jurisdictions begin to sort out how they want to fund the whole system. So um, I think that's, I don't know where CVTA is going to go, um, but that's my thought about it. On the other hand, if we put in language, like you said, this is a floor, um, you know, that can always be changed and it's a trigger. So language of this sort with numbers gives us a chance to re-examine. So you could do 15 to 10 or something like that if you want to. Uh, anyway. Hey Ben, I am, uh, you know, I'm good with the 15% number with the understanding that these are guidelines, it's not a legal document, and number two, we, we've got a lot, to learn, a lot to learn and we're going to be readdressing this topic either sooner or later, so, you know, I think as long as we feel like we've got some flexibility to do the right things, um, I'm certainly good with starting with a 15% um 15 85 percent ratio system-wide ian do you how strongly do you feel about the thing you suggested do you want to put something in there yeah I, i'm i'm definitely fine with the the 85 15 i just don't know if this language provides us the flexibility to administer it that way um you know i would just hate if we're you know like you said if we're calculating stuff and we're going back and forth and we need a 16 percent, then we have to go back and revise this document or or whatever the case may be so whatever we can do to make this as most as flexible as possible to, to meet the needs of GRTC and, and everything else, I think I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, I think that like uh, like Gary mentioned, we're going to be revisiting this. You know, we're not going to get it right on the first time. Uh, we're going to come back, you know, after ridership numbers um, get back to normal post COVID. And we'll be looking at these routes, making sure that they actually make sense. Maybe we'll be you know going more towards ridership maybe going more towards coverage if some of these coverage routes actually do perform really well so i think we'll be revisiting this annually if not uh, more often so how does it, the next to the last whereas i mean it that says 70 30 and then we're saying something different than that i mean uh, i'm not seeing that let me see all right yeah, Danny, that's just an explanation of the consideration of 100% versus an original 70-30. Okay, I mean, I was just wondering. So I think well. the resolution at the bottom will specify where we are. Okay. And and I kind of agree with Ian. I'm not sure that we, we say it in such a way that we make it very specific and sounding almost legal-like in that last sentence. I think we want to make sure it sounds that we're we're going to attempt to do an 85-15%. Okay. 
approach. I mean, what we mean is approximately. Um, I don't. That's not real hefty lang language, but approximately, I think, is accurate. Yeah. And yeah, approximately um, would be accurate. And then it serves as a trigger for us as if we begin to get yes. way off. We can we can revisit. Let's do approximately then. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? That makes yeah, sense prioritize up to approximately fifteen percent. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I like that. Senator, are you are you grabbing this so that we can see it what they're gonna vote on? Is that something you can do or should I share my screen? Um if you have this actual version in your format, that might be better. Because this is the version you all formatted in your in your style. So it probably is better for one of y'all to handle that. Since y'all okay. since y'all were the last ones to touch that version. <laughs> let me let me see if I can pull it up and then we can we can uh, make sure the language is exactly correct okay. for what you're voting on. It'll take me just a second to pull up and let Eldridge, how are you doing with this thing? I think we're gonna have to take a couple both looks at it. Uh, yeah. but uh, we gotta have some floor plan here, something to start with. You can I always go back and bag. <laughs> yeah. And, and and start somewhere. <laughs> I would just add in terms of the um, your ability to revisit this, obviously as a policy resolution, you all can revise this at any time. Um, and there the CVTA process does envision an annual reporting to CVTA about your, your spending, which is an opportunity for you to consider this um, and your uh, annual transit uh, development planning process is another opportunity to consider this. So there are multiple ways and times in, in your, your, your regular planning processes to consider this. So, um, may prioritize, <clears throat> we would strike that and we put, I, obviously, I cannot type, so on my apologies. You did well. We would change the, <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. I hate typing publicly. It's awful. I did horribly in that in high school when we had <laughs> old typewriters. I'm aging myself. Is that a more? Yeah. How's that, guys? Good to me. Good. Good. Can somebody move this? That's a move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, that the board of GRTC approved this resolution. Uh, are there further comments on it? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. <laughs> it's done. And let me just say, because uh, I want to make sure I do, that Adrian and Scudder, you guys are stars. And mm -hmm. um, really, um, you make us feel confident in your reliability and in the quality of your study. And um, the, uh, I know that you've been working with some pretty fine folks from the jurisdictions as well, and that, um, that you've really hashed this out and worked at it. So obviously things will change, we'll learn, but when you get this kind of baseline, you can, you can change and learn well from the, from the work you've already done. Um, other comments? Um, I, I've got a question that's not contained to this right now. Uh, Adrian Scudder, uh, Chesterfield board members. Uh, you, at one time, there was some talk of a route from uh, from out Chesterfield out Whaler out Hall Street to 288 over to uh, Innsbruck. Have anybody heard anything about that? And a, a commuter route? No. No, uh, you know, I remember to, to end. Jim, Jim Holland had recommended that something yeah. come down Route 111 and then over to the government and then up to 88. I, I remember some of that discussion happening at one point, but I've, I've not heard of anything else. I don't know if staff has had those conversations. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Have you? I haven't heard of express route. Mm. No, mm -hmm. I have had um, ex conversations with uh, Council Member Jones in Richmond about the desire to have what we call them a Nashville crosstown route. When you have a radial system that come in and out, a lot of times what you have is the a lack of ability of people to go around town to get to key centers. And we have a, a lack of those crosstown routes. I think that as we move forward with expansion of the system over the next five, 10 years and expansion, we need to look at some of those crosstown connectivities. I'm very uh, what that was actually one of the things I love about the connections that Scudder was showing in Chesterfield 
is that as we start putting in some of those 84, 85, 86 routes, um, they'll start to create some of the connectivity to get us around, not quite as far out as that Brandon Mill area will be closer in town, but um, hopefully we'll be able to create something that'll get us around to connect Chesterfield and Ryko and Richmond on that west side and the loop, but this does not address that yet, but that is a goal. All right. Yeah, my three, my three undone things are um, straightening out Route 20 so that it goes straight down the boulevard um, and doesn't go off into that two block thing into Scott's edition that nobody uses or um, doesn't go over to Robinson, but just goes straight on down the boulevard. And um, also a direct and rapid service between the airport and Amtrak station and the Pulse. I just think um, for a major city not to have direct connections by public transit to its inner city transportation is just bizarre. And um, so I hope we'll look at those in the future and I'm sure that will happen long after I'm no longer around this board. Um, but anyway, uh, other comments for the day. All right, I'm gonna declare this out. You guys, thanks so much for this work. Um, it's really encouraging. And I think we should celebrate um, a real achievement here. And I pray somehow this makes it through the next stage. <laughs> All right, um, this meeting is adjourned. All right.